This is Spencer with the MacGuffin, and today I'm joined by Clark Gregg, uh, who has been at SIF, I don't know, at least two other times that I've counted. I know that I was here last year, it was my first time. I had another film that was here oh, okay. in 2008, you didn't come out for but I, they didn't get me here. No, I didn't. I'm just, heartbroken just about on that. Yeah. No, You're... I know, because last year was my first year here, and I'd never been to Seattle. And I flipped, right. and I. I've been now, begging now for three months, back, yeah. can I please come back with Trust Me? And they were kind enough. Um, thank you, Carl Spence, for um, getting me here. Awesome. Uh, well, you mentioned it. You are here um, with Trust Me, a film which you wrote, directed, starred in, produced, I'm sure probably many other tasks. Um, so why don't we begin with that? So there's a whole bunch of weird uh, sides I want to get to with okay. your career. But um, Trust Me <laughs> is the story of an agent uh, who works, I guess, it, it's not explicitly said, but I believe it's just with children, at child actors. Yeah, he's an agent for child actors, a struggling agent for child actors, and a former child almost star himself. Right. Um, working basically in the kind of periphery, the, the seedy outer reaches of Hollywood. Well, that, that is one of the first things I want to talk about is, um, <laughs> A, how accurate <laughs> is that, uh, display of an agent in Hollywood, and B, what was your uh, own agent's response upon hearing you wanted to do a, a film about agents and after seeing the film? Um, I don't, it's certainly, there was a lot of research and there's a lot of stuff in there that came from real stories. Um, that said, I actually didn't have a huge interest in doing an expose of the kind of child actors business. And I wouldn't say that this is representative at all. It's much more, I saw some people, and it's no one person, it was a couple of different people kind of mashed together. I saw some people who, this is what they did. They kind of worked on the periphery, hustled their ass off trying to, you know, find the young kid that would, you know, take them to the big time. And the parents who, you know, had these, Hopes, sometimes realistic, sometimes not realistic. And I gotta say, I, I've worked with a number of actors, including the brilliant young actress who's in this film, who couldn't be from healthier backgrounds and better taken care of. This, to me, became just a metaphorical exploration of the kind of obsessive myth of the transformational power of stardom. I, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting film. Before we get too deep into that, I also wanna say, Agents are kind of an interesting um, character in the history of Hollywood. I mean, you obviously have some iconic ones like Jerry Maguire, Ari Gold from Entourage. Was that something that you worried about being sort of lumped into the spectrum of agents? Because it's it's become such, I don't want to say like cliche in terms of like, you know, how Ari Gold was in Entourage and Jeremy Piven's performance there. But I mean, that's that's what people have come to assume agents are like. Is is that at all something that entered your mind when you're ri writing this, or were you just like, I have my own take on this. It's going to stand on its own. I don't really care what anyone else has done. It's no, you know, it's <laughs> I, I'm so um, I'm so myopic when it when it comes to kind of creating something like this. It never really occurred to me. I, I just it's funny because uh, uh, this is a little bit psycho. I. Uh, I didn't feel like I was writing a movie about show business. I knew that there was a lot I didn't have to research because I knew it. I just, to me, it was, it, was, it was a film noir, a comedic film noir that was, about, that was about kind of desperation and just happened to be set in that world. And then when I went about trying to raise the money, everyone was like, eh, we're not so good on you know, insider showbiz things. And I was like, oh, God, of course it is. It never even occurred to me. <laughs> It's kind of funny because you mentioned it being comedic noir, and I think that's a good description of it. I go to like IMDb, and they're like comedy, and you know the first half of it is pretty funny, but there's a point which I'm like, this is definitely drifting. So it's kind of it's, it's funny. I know I don't have to say. I, uh, to me, some of the parts that other people find funny, I find heartbreaking, and some of the parts that people find heartbreaking, I find kind of I'm, I find kind of funny, but yeah, I knew I was trying something unusual, and. It works spectacularly well for some people and not as well for others. And I think uh, I definitely thought about that. I thought, you know, this movie has a real breadth of tone. And I thought 
that's what life feels like to me, and it's what it felt like this story is to me. It's kind of funny, and then it's not. And that's what I. That's why I make independent films when mm. I do. Is if I'm just doing the same model as a more expensive film, I, I don't. I don't What's see the, the point. point yeah. I wanted to try something, um, and and yet you know you're right. It's kind of marketed as a comedy. I think because it's a strange moment in independent film, and I don't think people trust. You know? I, I think I think there's just more of a general population or general audience thing. Have this weird, and I've, I've I mean, people disagree with me, but I sort of feel like general audiences kind of slightly fear independent film. They kind of lump it with art house film, mm -hmm. and they think it's like, oh, I'm not going to get it. It's too complicated, even though it runs the exact same gamut as mainstream films. And so it seems like it's probably easier to just be. Like, it's a comedy. Like go see a comedy, but it's more complex and thought provoking than that. Oh, thank just you. Generic. Thing. Thank you. I, I, you know, and I understood. On the other hand, I really understood the people who kind of took a chance on releasing this movie in, in a very unusual way. That's I guess more and more common, where it's available on iTunes right now, and it's mm. going to hit theaters in ten days. Um, they really felt like, you know, that people would connect with the comedy and that would make them watch it and then the kind of nuance and the ways that it changed they would get later. And I think it's, people are very nervous about independent films for exactly the reason you said right now. They, I don't think they're sure that people want complexity. And yet, it's funny with social media, I get, I'm much more in touch with people's reactions to the film initially than I normally would be. And uh, it seems like a lot of people kind of almost were afraid that they were getting just a kind of run-of-the-mill showbiz comedy and were very gratified that it took some chances. It's just getting them in the door that's the challenge. Once you're getting there, most people seem to enjoy it, but it's sort of getting them to cross that threshold. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about you as a writer on this film, because I thought it was interesting. I will sort of scroll back through your history as a writer, and it's kind of interesting because this, I believe, was your first um, that you had written all the way through as a solo writer. I mean, you had worked on What Lies Beneath, which I found <laughs> fascinating. Um, you uh, adapted Choke from Chuck Palahniuk, which mm -hmm. was at SIF 2008. What is that sort of evolution like as a writer? Is this something you hope to do more of going forward? Uh, I mean... Mm, yes, I would love to. Uh, I started out with a theater company in New York. I was lucky enough to be in this great class at NYU with Dave Mamet and Bill Macy and my pal Felicity Huffman. And, um, all of whom show up in this like, movie. Yeah, yeah. They're all in the movie except yeah. for Mamet. Um, yeah, that's true. And uh, you know, we had a theater where you kind of did everything. And you were kind of responsible for the storytelling, and sometimes you'd direct, and sometimes you'd act. And that became really a part of what we did, and what I did. And I wanted to write a lot, but I found it terrifying, because I have so much respect for good writing. And it wasn't until I moved to Los Angeles after, you know, kind of eight or ten years doing theater in New York, and to try to get some work in movies and got nowhere, that I had enough desperation and boredom going on that I was able to sit down and actually write a script. And that script was too weird to really get made, although it came surprisingly close. And instead, I got hired to write this movie, this kind of ghost project at DreamWorks, which became What Lies Beneath. And I was actually the only writer on it all the way through. There was a story by credit, yeah, but it was from a different thing. Interesting. And, um, and that's because Bob Zemeckis was incredibly generous and kind of gave me a film school. And I got into that because I wanted to make films and have my friends be in them. Mm. That, to me, always seemed like the funnest possible thing. And I'd been in a couple of indies with other people I knew and it's just it's the greatest experience ever and it's it's what I did in choke as much as I could and it's what I did even more so here I knew that if I was going to take on such a monumental task as trying to act the lead role I needed to surround myself with people I loved and felt comfortable with who would push me and protect me and so I went to all my best friends and the actors who I loved the most that's great one of the clear themes of the movie is metamorphosis uh, I was thinking about it before I came, I didn't come up with quite as clever of a term yet. I'm still working on it. But your own career has sort of experienced a metamorphosis over the last decade. I mean, you've really served sort of dozens of them, really. Yeah. But yes, but especially once. I mean, you know, with the success with Agent Coulson, Marvel Universe, mm -hmm. and you know, a, as a director, you've done like Choke and this. I mean, you're definitely sort of evolving and becoming beloved <laughs> uh, amongst uh, film lovers. But was that something that you thought about? coming into this? I mean, obviously, reconnaissance is a great term. Were you at all thinking about your own metamorphosis coming into this movie, or is metamorphosis just something that always 
intrigued you about people? How, how did that sort of come into play with this? Um, it's funny you say that. I haven't quite thought of it that way. I definitely believe that there... I believe that there was this idea, and I certainly... I don't judge it because I feel like I have this idea myself. This idea that... Uh, I went to a really interesting uh, psychologist... Uh, named Phil Stutz, uh, who has this great book called The Tools, and he talks about this thing called the ultimate event. And it's this idea that you have that I'll do this and then everything will change. And life doesn't really work that way. You do a bunch of little things, and you show up in a bunch of little ways, and you evolve a character, you know. And it's kind of a, it's a deathly idea. And I believe that there's this idea of stardom and what and success really the stardom even that was a metaphor for success this american idea of i'm going to get that thing and then suddenly everything will be perfect and it's the myth that drives us and there's always 50% of the people in the bottom 50% mm -hmm. you know that there's a kind of uh, there's a, there's a kind of unspoken savagery to the kind of capitalist ideal as it's manifested everywhere including hollywood and so I was interested in that idea of transformation. I was interested in writing about a character who had spent his whole life pursuing a kind of transformation, in his mind a transformation, back into something he nearly became, and then achieving it in a completely different way than he had imagined. And, and that's where this idea came from. That's where the, the kind of transformation metaphor came to. As far as it pertains to my own career transformations, I have, a, I have always felt like I, that I have to believe I am continue to evolve and that I'm able to continue to evolve. Because if I feel like that stops, I don't know what to think of myself. I never felt satisfied with where I was as a human or an artist. And I always really kind of wanted to believe that if I worked hard enough and did the right things, I could find another deeper level to get to. And... And... Uh, that said, there's nothing that I've done that would really earn this kind of crazy later life, you know, emergence from a chrysalis. I've, I've certainly been given opportunities since I turned 40 that I thought had long since passed me by. Uh, I mean, yeah, you're definitely becoming beloved in the world. I mean, both in terms of mainstream audiences with things like Avengers, but like the thing about Much Ado About Nothing, that had a huge response, and that was very much an indie film. Crazy. Just... The brilliance of Joss Whedon that he could make a movie, a Shakespeare movie, in 11 days in his house yeah. and have it work so well. One of the things I want to talk about is one very obscure reference in this film that probably might be one of the most obscure things you'll be asked about that is not a major issue. I'm excited. But I loved the reference to Jan Michael Vincent. Mostly just because I was a huge Airwolf fan growing up. <laughs> so I was kind of curious as to what the genesis of picking Jan Michael Vincent, because that felt like a very bizarre choice to me, but very much appreciated. This is sad. What, what, when do I talk about Jan Michael Vincent? When you're talking about some, was oh, it Surf the, Camp? The fake movie. Yeah, oh, the yeah. fake movie that your character yeah. was going to be a breakout star from. When I was a kid, they would drop us off at the movie theaters on the weekends, and we'd watch four or five movies. And a lot, they were Disney movies, and they were, I'm older than you, so it was like the world's greatest athlete, and Herbie the Love Bug, and sometimes there'd be one with a bear, you know, nature movie, narrated about a bear cub trying to survive the winter. Oh, I, I, I know those. You films. know those oh, yeah. ones. Oh, I love them. And yeah. these were the stars I grew up with, and one of them was Anissa Jones from Family Affair, who had a big, kind of like... I would say I kind of had a crush on her older sister in the show, but <laughs> these were the people I grew up with, and Anissa Jones met this, you know, horrifying end. Mm. So many of them had such a damn. Jan Michael Vincent's had a rough go of it, yeah. and I kind of picked all these people, you know, and fictionalized them or added fictional siblings, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. and several people, you know, weren't in such bad shape. And by the end of the movie, you know, there's a Justin Bieber reference. <laughs> Yeah. His cousin, we think his cousin has gotten this role that young Lydia is supposed to have gotten. And, you know, that was just because he was on my daughter's playlist. Are, yeah. And now he's kind of one of these young kids who got too much fame too early and now is in trouble. And that's really an idea behind the movie. It was just this idea that, you know, without getting too maudlin about it, that people are willing to subvert even this kind of 
quasi-sacrosanct thing, which is childhood, or should be sacrosanct, about the idea that this fame can can transform their whole lives, and it seems to just torpedo so many families. And I don't know, that just seemed, it seemed like a noir to me. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, th I, think it, I think it came together great. Um, I want to also sort of talk about going and adapting the work of Chuck Palahniuk for mm -hmm. Choke. Yeah. Uh, how, what was that experience like, and how did working on that project sort of influence you with this film and going forward? Because that was definitely sort of interesting, provocative film. I mean, Chuck Palahniuk's work is very... I don't know what you want to call it, controversial, potentially. Um, he's beloved by some, hated by others, but he's very unique in his voice. He has an army of people who are obsessed with his work. I, I thought the book of Fight Club was visionary. I think he's the, one of the great American satirists. And I thought, and I read someone sent me Choke after What Lies Beneath was about to come out to see if I would adapt it. Wow. And I said, I will adapt it if I can direct it and I won't take a dime. And somehow that worked out. Because ironically, Fight Club hadn't made a lot of money and so this was available to people who was considered not a success in our crazy culture. And, um, and so, so, I, so I said, this is great. There's so much funny stuff. I just think it's funny and twisted and my sense of humor. And I'm just going to basically, you know, transcribe it into a screenplay and there we go. And I talked to Chuck Palahniuk briefly, and I said, I don't know, man, it seems like a love story to me. It seems like a romantic comedy. And he said, oh, thank God. Yes, that's exactly right. Please don't be too faithful to, this, to the book. Hmm, interesting. I said, interesting to hear from the writer. Yeah. I, I bet he's testing me. So I wrote a very faithful adaptation that just was awful. And it didn't work at all. Super faithful. I mean, you know, it hadn't, here we go, hadn't made the transformation. Mm. It can't. To become a movie, it has to become a movie. It has to go through the physics of becoming that visual, three-dimensional reality. And you got to change it. And it wasn't until I spent two or three kind of, you know, taking other jobs in the meantime, but really difficult couple of years trying to get to the place where I could really see what's the movie of this and kind of let go of the book and add some stuff and kind of let the, some characters breathe that didn't get to breathe as much in the book that I sent him a draft that he really liked. I didn't send him, he didn't, I didn't send him any of the ones he didn't like, but he, you know, he's like, I love this new stuff. He's such an amazing, he's such an amazing kind of person. He felt like a mentor to me because it really started to come alive when, it really started to come alive when I listened to his words four years later. And his thing was, I, this is a chain letter to me. I thrive on the stuff that, mm -hmm. that you add. And there wasn't a lot of it, but there was some stuff. And he showed up in the set, and we all loved him. And we, I put him in a tiny scene at the very last day of shooting, just a cameo. And uh, and he, he loved the movie, and he came and supported it at Sundance and helped us with the release. And it was really an amazing experience to me. There was so much. It was so difficult. Directing your first movie is a lot like having your first baby you don't know what to expect you don't know what it's going to be people can tell you about it you won't get it and it's also you add the time element i also the other thing it sounds felt like to me was someone throwing you out of an airplane with a parachute kit and you have to build it and inflate it before you hit the ground and it was so nuts all the compromises and trying to figure out how to get this wild vision up on the screen and i thought it nearly killed me making it but it ended up being a great experience. Well, that's sort of one of the things I thought was interesting that you decided to be the lead actor in this movie because, I mean, it seems like, to me, from an outsider's perspective, that it would be very time-consuming to even just write and direct a movie, let alone... I swore after Choke I would never make a movie in the 25 days I had for Choke. I would always have to have more, and I would never act in one again because those three days in the small part in Choke were really hard. And then I wrote this, and my partner, Mary Vernus, was, you know... I, th I think that you wrote the part for you that you should be playing. Mm -hmm. And and I, I thought, oh, God, no. I, oh, is that right? <laughs> and I uh, definitely, a part of me thought, how are you going to give this part to somebody else? No, You're 50 years old. No one's ever given you a part like this. They probably never will. I mean, but I really, <laughs> I doubted that deeply. And I woke up a lot of nights thinking of different directors that I could kind of call, or different actors I could call to give up mm. one of those two jobs. And I never did. I never did. And I, it, it ended up feeling like the right decision in that there was a chaos 
and a netlessness flying kind of feeling like trapeze with no net that just felt exactly like Howard Holloway. I just felt completely in over my head. Um, and yet I got really lucky and hired a brilliant DP in Terry Stacy and got a brilliant producer in Keith Carvel and Mary Vernu and people really watched my back. I got these actors who just showed up and delivered. And you know, what's out there feels closer to my original vision than, than I could have ever hoped for. So now that this is coming to, or is on iTunes now, coming to theaters in 10 days. It's what? on iTunes and video demand. Most kind of VOD or on demand things, it's there now. And it comes out in, you know, independent release, 12, 15 cities, uh, June 6th. What do you have coming up next? I have to ask, do you want to or will we see you in Avengers 2? And is there anything else that we should pay attention to? I have heard no. Up? I've heard nothing to believe that I will show up in Age of Ultron. Um, Start the campaign now, people. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm pretty grateful for having had such a great role in Avengers One, and I'm very happy to be brought back to life as Agent Coulson. So I, I got are. I got no complaints. Um, I'm excited to see Age of Ultron. I, I, I've heard the script is amazing. I I can always I can't wait to see what Joss does next with it. Um, you know, if they call me, I'll go okay. <laughs> to any Marvel movie. But I'm actually, i got to say, I'm really thrilled with where the back half of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. really ended and the kind of amazing cameo from the brilliant Sam Jackson to show up mm -hmm. and really bring us home at the end of the season and Bill Paxton. We just had a great cast. Um, and you have Twitters, anything else people should follow in case they'll see where I'm doing the social next. media. That's how I'm, you know, that's what's, you make a little odd comedy like trust me that I'm in love with and care about so deeply the work of all these great actors and, and artists uh, I'm lucky to have friends on social media who help me get the word out that's what I'm doing I don't know what I'm going to do this summer um, other than I'll probably try to grab a few minutes and try to write something that I could make next year on the break and you're at Clark Gregg I believe that's at great. Clark Gregg yeah awesome thank you so much Clark thanks for having uh, me and check out trust me on iTunes or in a theater near you Please. and uh, check out more interviews at MacGuffin that's MacGuff.in and we'll see you next time check out MacGuffin Magneto can't stop me I'm on fire tonight even Zod can't stop me I'm on fire tonight don't even try to bite the sun can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop I'm me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.